Chapter Five of the Story of the Amulet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of the Amulet by Edith Nesbit. Chapter Five: The Fight in the Village. Here was a horrible position. Four English children, whose proper date was A.D. 1905 and whose proper address was London set down in egypt in the year six thousand b c with no means whatever of getting back into their own time and place they could not find the east and the sun was of no use at the moment because some officious person had once explained to cyril that the sun did not really set in the west at all nor rise in the east either for the matter of that the samiad had crept out of the bass bag when they were not looking and had basely deserted them an enemy was approaching there would be a fight people get killed in fights and the idea of taking part in a fight was one that did not appeal to the children the man who had brought the news of the enemy still lay panting on the sand his tongue was hanging out long and red like a dog's the people of the village were hurriedly filling the gaps in the fence with thorn bushes from the heap that seemed to have been piled there ready for just such a need they lifted the cluster thorns with long poles much as men at home nowadays lift hay with a fork jane bit her lip and tried to decide not to cry robert felt in his pocket for a toy pistol and loaded it with a pink paper cap it was his only weapon cyril tightened his belt two holes and anthea absently took the drooping red roses from the buttonholes of the others bit the ends of the stalks and set them in a pot of water that stood in the shadow by a hut door she was always rather silly about flowers look here she said i think perhaps the samiad is really arranging something for us i don't believe it would go away and leave us all alone in the past i'm certain it wouldn't jane succeeded in deciding not to cry at any rate yet but what can we do robert asked nothing cyril answered promptly except keep our eyes and ears open look that runner chap's getting his wind let's go and hear what he's got to say the runner had risen to his knees and was sitting back on his heels now he stood up and spoke he began by some respectful remarks addressed to the heads of the village his speech got more interesting when he said i went out in my raft to snare ubises and i had gone up the stream an hour's journey then i set my snares and waited and i heard the sound of many wings and looking up saw many herons circling in the air and i saw that they were afraid so i took thought a beast may scare one heron coming upon it suddenly but no beast will scare a whole flock of herons and still they flew and circled and would not light so then i knew that what scared the herons must be men and men who knew not our ways of going softly so as to take the birds and beasts unawares by this i knew they were not of our race or of our place so leaving my raft i crept along the river bank and at last came upon the strangers they are many as the sands of the desert and their spear heads shine red like the sun they are terrible people and their march is towards us having seen this i ran and did not stay till i was before you these are your folk said the headman, turning suddenly and angrily on Cyril. You came as spies for them. We did not, said Cyril indignantly. We wouldn't be spies for anything. I'm certain these people aren't a bit like us. Are they now? He asked the runner. No, was the answer. These men's faces were darkened, and their hair black as night yet these strange children maybe are their gods who have come before to make ready the way for them a murmur ran through the crowd no no said cyril again we are on your side we will help you to guard your sacred things 
the headman seemed impressed by the fact that cyril knew that there were sacred things to be guarded he stood a moment gazing at the children then he said it is well and now let all make offering that we may be strong in battle the crowd dispersed and nine men wearing antelope skins grouped themselves in front of the opening in the hedge in the middle of the village and presently one by one the men brought all sorts of things hippopotamus flesh ostrich feathers the fruit of the date palms red chalk green chalk fish from the river and ibex from the mountains and the headman received these gifts there was another hedge inside the first about a yard from it so that there was a lane inside between the hedges and every now and then one of the headmen would disappear along this lane with full hands and come back with hands empty they're making offerings to their amulet said anthea we'd better give something too the pockets of the party hastily explored yielded a piece of pink tape a bit of sealing wax and part of the waterbury watch that robert had not been able to help taking to pieces at christmas and had never had time to rearrange most boys have a watch in this condition they presented their offerings and anthea added the red roses the headman who took the things looked at them with awe especially at the red roses and the waterbury watch fragment this is a day of very wondrous happenings he said i have no more room in me to be astonished our maiden says there was peace between you and us but for this coming of a four we should have made sure the children shuddered now speak are you upon our side yes don't i keep telling you we are robert said look here i will give you a sign you see this he held out the toy pistol i shall speak to it and if it answers me you will know that i and the others are come to guard your sacred thing that we've just made the offerings to will that god whose image you hold in your hand speak to you alone or shall i also hear it asked the man cautiously you'll be surprised when you do hear it said robert now then he looked at the pistol and said if we are to guard the sacred treasure within he pointed to the hedged-in space speak with thy loud voice and we shall obey he pulled the trigger and the cap went off the noise was loud for it was a two-shilling pistol and the caps were excellent every man woman and child in the village fell on its face on the sand the headman who had accepted the test rose first the voice has spoken he said lead them into the ante-room of the sacred thing so now the four children were led in through the opening of the hedge and round the lane till they came to an opening in the inner hedge and they went through an opening in that and so passed into another lane the thing was built something like this and all the hedges were of brushwood and thorns drawing of maize omitted it's like the maize at hampton court whispered anthea the lanes were all open to the sky but the little hut in the middle of the maze was round roofed and a curtain of skins hung over the doorway here you may wait said their guide but do not dare to pass the curtain he himself passed it and disappeared but look here whispered cyril some of us ought to be outside in case the samiad turns up don't let's get separated from each other whatever we do said anthea it's quite bad enough to be separated from the samiad we can't do anything while that man is in there let's all go out into the village again we can come back later now we know the way in that man will have to fight like the rest most likely if it comes to fighting if we find the samiad we'll go straight home it must be getting late and i don't much like this mazy place they went out and told the headman that they would protect the treasure when the fighting began and now they looked about them and were able to see exactly how a first-class worker in flint flakes and notches an arrowhead or the edge of an axe an advantage which no other person now alive has ever enjoyed the boys found the weapons most interesting the arrowheads were not on arrows such as you shoot from a bow but on javelins for throwing from the hand the chief weapon was a stone fastened to a rather short stick something like the things gentlemen used to carry about and call life preservers in the days of the garotters then there were long things like spears or lances 
with flint knives horribly sharp and flint battle-axes every one in the village was so busy that the place was like an ant-heap when you have walked into it by accident the women were busy and even the children quite suddenly all the air seemed to glow and grow red it was like the sudden opening of a furnace door such as you may see at woolwich arsenal if you ever have the luck to be taken there and then almost as suddenly it was as though the furnace doors had been shut for the sun had set and it was night the sun had that abrupt way of setting in egypt eight thousand years ago and i believe it has never been able to break itself of the habit and sets in exactly the same manner to the present day the girl brought the skins of wild deer and led the children to a heap of dry sedge my father says they will not attack yet sleep she said and it really seemed a good idea you may think that in the midst of all these dangers the children would not have been able to sleep but somehow though they were rather frightened now and then the feeling was growing in them deep down and almost hidden away but still growing that the samiad was to be trusted and that they were really and truly safe this did not prevent their being quite as much frightened as they could bear to be without being perfectly miserable i suppose we'd better go to sleep said robert i don't know what on earth poor old nurse will do with us out all night set the police on our tracks i expect i only wish they could find us a dozen policemen would be rather welcome just now but it's no use getting into a stew over it he added soothingly good night and they all fell asleep they were awakened by long loud terrible sounds that seemed to come from everywhere at once horrible threatening shouts and shrieks and howls that sounded as cyril said later like the voices of men thirsting for their enemy's blood it is the voice of the strange men said the girl coming to them trembling through the dark they have attacked the walls and the thorns have driven them back my father says they will not try again until daylight but they are shouting to frighten us as though we were savages dwellers in the swamps she cried indignantly all night the terrible noise went on but when the sun rose as abruptly as he had said the sound suddenly ceased the children had hardly time to be glad of this before a shower of javelins came hurtling over the great thorn hedge and every one sheltered behind the huts but next moment another shower of weapons came from the opposite side and the crowd rushed to other shelter cyril pulled out a javelin that had stuck in the roof of the hut beside him its head was of brightly burnished copper then the sound of shouting arose again and the crackle of dried thorns the enemy was breaking down the hedge all the villagers swarmed to the point whence the crackling and the shouting came they hurled stones over the hedges and short arrows with flint heads the children had never before seen men with the fighting light in their eyes it was very strange and terrible and gave you a queer thick feeling in your throat it was quite different from the pictures of fights in the illustrated papers at home it seemed that the showers of stones had driven back the besiegers the besieged drew breath but at that moment the shouting and the crackling arose on the opposite side of the village and the crowd hastened to defend that point and so the fight swayed to and fro across the village for the besieged had not the sense to divide their forces as their enemies had done cyril noticed that every now and then certain of the fighting men would enter the maze and come out with brighter faces a braver aspect and a more upright carriage i believe they go and touch the amulet he said you know the samiad said it could make people brave they crept through the maze and watching they saw that cyril was right a headman was standing in front of the skin curtain and as the warriors came before him he murmured a word they could not hear and touched their foreheads with something that they could not see and this something he held in his hands and through his fingers they saw the gleam of a red stone that they knew the fight raged across the thorn hedge outside suddenly there was a loud and bitter cry they are in they are in the hedge is down the headman disappeared behind the deerskin curtain he's gone to hide it said anthea oh sammy dear how could you leave us suddenly there was a shriek from inside the hut and the headman staggered out white with fear and fled out through the maze 
the children were as white as he <gasps> what is it what is it moaned anthea oh samiad how could you how could you and the sound of the fight sank breathlessly and swelled fiercely all around it was like the rising and falling of the waves of the sea anthea shuddered and said again oh samiad samiad well said a brisk voice and the curtain of skins was lifted at one corner by a furry hand and out peeped the bat's ears and snail's eyes of the samiad anthea caught it in her arms and a sigh of desperate relief was breathed by each of the four oh which is the east anthea said and she spoke hurriedly for the noise of wild fighting drew nearer and nearer don't choke me said the samiad come inside the inside of the hut was pitch dark i've got a match said cyril and struck it the floor of the hut was of soft loose sand i've been asleep here said the samiad most comfortable it's been the best sand i've had for a month it's all right everything's all right i knew your only chance would be while the fight was going on that man won't come back i bit him and he thinks i'm an evil spirit now you've only got to take the thing and go the hut was hung with skins heaped in the middle were the offerings that had been given the night before anthea's roses fading on the top of the heap at one side of the hut stood a large square stone block and on it an oblong box of earthenware with strange figures of men and beasts on it is the thing in there asked cyril as the samiad pointed a skinny finger at it you must judge of that said the samiad the man was just going to bury the box in the sand when i jumped out at him and bit him light another match robert said anthea now then quick which is the east why where the sun rises of course but someone told us oh they'll tell you anything said the samiad impatiently getting into its bass bag and wrapping itself in its waterproof sheet but we can't see the sun in here and it isn't rising anyhow said jane how you do waste time the samiad said why the east's where the shrine is of course there it pointed to the great stone and still the shouting and the clash of stone on metal sounded nearer and nearer the children could hear that the headmen had surrounded the hut to protect their treasure as long as might be from the enemy but none dare to come in after the samiad's sudden fierce biting of the headman now jane said cyril very quickly i'll take the amulet you stand ready to hold up the charm and be sure you don't let it go as you come through he made a step forward but at that instant a great crackling overhead ended in a blaze of sunlight the roof had been broken in at one side and great slabs of it were being lifted off by two spears as the children trembled and winked in the new light large dark hands tore down the wall and a dark face with a blobby fat nose looked over the gap even at that awful moment anthea had time to think that it was very like the face of mr jacob absalom who had sold them the charm in the shop near charing cross here is their amulet cried a harsh strange voice it is this that makes them strong to fight and brave to die and what else have we here gods or demons he glared fiercely at the children and the whites of his eyes were very white indeed he had a wet red copper knife in his teeth there was not a moment to lose jane jane, jane quick cried everyone passionately jane with trembling hands held up the charm towards the east and cyril spoke the word of power the amulet grew to a great arch out beyond it was the glaring egyptian sky the broken wall the cruel dark big-nosed face with the red wet knife in its gleaming teeth within the arch was the dull faint greeny brown of london grass and trees 
Hold tight, Jane! Cyril cried, and he dashed through the arch, dragging Anthea and the Samiad after him. Robert followed, clutching Jane. And in the ears of each, as they passed through the arch of the charm, the sound and fury of battle died out suddenly and utterly, and they heard only the low, dull, discontented hum of vast London, and the peaking and patting of the sparrows on the gravel, and the voices of the ragged baby children playing ring a roses on the yellow trampled grass. And the charm was a little charm again in Jane's hand, and there was the basket, with their dinner and the bath buns, lying just where they had left it. "'My hat!' said Cyril, drawing a long breath. "'That was something like an adventure.' "'It was rather like one, certainly,' said the Samiad. They all lay still, breathing in the safe, quiet air of Regent's Park. "'We'd better go home at once,' said Anthea presently. "'Old Nurse will be most frightfully anxious. The sun looks about the same as it did when we started yesterday.' We've been away twenty-four hours. The buns are quite soft still, said Cyril, feeling one. I suppose the dew kept them fresh. They were not hungry, curiously enough. They picked up the dinner basket and the Samiad basket and went straight home. Old Nurse met them with amazement. Well, if I ever did, she said, what's gone wrong? You've soon tired of your picnic. The children took this to be bitter irony, which means saying the exact opposite of what you mean in order to make yourself disagreeable, as when you happen to have a dirty face and someone says, How nice and clean you look! We're very sorry, began Anthea, but old nurse said, Oh, bless me, child, I don't care. Please yourselves and you'll please me. Come in and get your dinners comfortable. I've got a potato on a boiling. When she had gone to attend to the potatoes, the children looked at each other. Could it be that old nurse had so changed that she no longer cared that they should have been away from home for twenty-four hours? All night, in fact, without any explanation whatever. But the Samiad put its head out of its basket and said, What's the matter? Don't you understand? You come back through the charm arch at the same time as you go through it. This isn't tomorrow. Is it still yesterday? asked Jane. No, it's today, the same as it's always been. It wouldn't do to go mixing up the present and the past and cutting bits out of one to fit into the other. Then all that adventure took no time at all? You can call it that if you like, said the Samiad. It took none of the modern time, anyhow. That evening, Anthea carried up a steak for the learned gentleman's dinner. She persuaded Beatrice, the maid of all work, who had given her the bangle with the blue stone, to let her do it, and she stayed and talked to him, by special invitation, while he ate the dinner. She told him the whole adventure, beginning with, This afternoon we found ourselves on the bank of the River Nile, and ending up with, and then we remembered how to get back, and there we were in Regent's Park, and it hadn't taken any time at all. She did not tell anything about the charm or the Samiad, because that was forbidden, but the story was quite wonderful enough, even as it was, to entrance the learned gentleman. You are a most unusual little girl, he said. Who tells you all these things? No one, said Anthea. They just happen. Make believe, he said slowly, as one who recalls and pronounces a long forgotten word. He sat long after she had left him. At last he roused himself with a start. I really must take a holiday, he said. My nerves must be all out of order. I actually have a perfectly distinct impression that the little girl from the rooms below came in and gave me a coherent and graphic picture of life as I conceive it to have been in pre-dynastic Egypt. Strange what tricks the mind will play. I should have to be more careful. He finished his bread conscientiously, and actually went for a mile walk, 
before he went back to his work. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of the Story of the Amulet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Story of the Amulet by Edith Nesbitt. Chapter Six, The Way to Babylon. How many miles to Babylon? Three score and ten. Can I get there by candlelight? Yes, and back again. Jane was singing to her doll, rocking it to and fro in the house which she had made for herself and it. The roof of the house was the dining table, and the walls were tablecloths and antimacassars hanging all round, and kept in their places by books laid on their top ends at the table edge. The others were tasting the fearful joys of domestic tobogganing. You know how it is done, with the largest and best tea tray and the surface of the stair carpet. It is best to do it on the days when the stair rods are being cleaned, and the carpet is only held by the nails at the top. Of course, it is one of the five or six thoroughly tip-top games that grown-up people are so unjust to, and old nurse, though a brick in many respects, was quite enough of a standard grown-up to put her foot down on the tobogganing long before any of the performers had had half enough of it. The tea-tray was taken away, and the baffled party entered the sitting-room in exactly the mood not to be pleased if they could help it. So Cyril said, What a beastly mess! And Robert added, Do shut up, Jane. Even Anthea, who was almost always kind, advised Jane to try another song. I'm sick to death of that, said she. It was a wet day, so none of the plans for seeing all the sights of London that can be seen for nothing could be carried out. Everyone had been thinking all the morning about the wonderful adventures of the day before, when Jane had held up the charm, and it had turned into an arch, through which they had walked, straight out of the present time and the Regent's Park, into the land of Egypt, eight thousand years ago. The memory of yesterday's happenings was still extremely fresh and frightening, so that everyone hoped that no one would suggest another excursion into the past for it seemed to all that yesterday's adventures were quite enough to last for at least a week. Yet each felt a little anxious that the others should not think it was afraid, and presently Cyril, who really was not a coward, began to see that it would not be at all nice if he should have to think himself one. So he said, I say, about that charm, Jane, come out. We ought to talk about it anyhow. Oh, if that's all, said Robert. Jane obediently wriggled to the front of her house and sat there. She felt for the charm to make sure that it was still round her neck. It isn't all, said Cyril, saying much more than he meant, because he thought Robert's tone had been rude, as indeed it had. We ought to go and look for that amulet. What's the good of having a first-class charm and keeping it idle, just eating its head off in the stable. I'm game for anything, of course, said Robert, but he added, with a fine air of chivalry, Only I don't think the girls are keen today somehow. Oh, yes, I am, said Anthea hurriedly. If you think I'm afraid, I'm not. I am, though, said Jane heavily. I didn't like it, and I won't go there again. Not for anything I won't. We shouldn't go there again, silly, said Cyril. It would be some other place. I dare say. A place with lions and tigers in it as likely as not. Seeing Jane so frightened made the others feel quite brave. They said they were certain they ought to go. It's so ungrateful to the Samyad not to, Anthea added, a little primly. Jane stood up. She was desperate. I won't! she cried. I won't, I won't, I won't. If you make me, I'll scream, and scream, and I'll tell old nurse, and I'll get her to burn the charm in the kitchen fire. So now then. You can imagine how furious everyone was with Jane for feeling what each of them had felt all the morning. In each breast, the same thought arose. 
No, no one can, can say it's our fault. fault. And they at once began to show Jane how angry they all felt that all the fault was hers. This made them feel quite brave. Tell tale tit, its tongue shall be split, and all the dogs in our town shall have a little bit, sang Robert. It's always the way if you have girls in anything. Cyril spoke in a cold displeasure that was worse than Robert's cruel quotation, and even Anthea said, Well, I'm not afraid if I am a girl. Which, of course, was the most cutting thing of all. Jane picked up her doll and faced the others with what is sometimes called the courage of despair. I don't care, she said. I won't, so there. It's just silly going to places when you don't want to, and when you don't know what they're going to be like. You can laugh at me as much as you like. You're beasts, and I hate you all. With these awful words, she went out and banged the door. Then the others would not look at each other, and they did not feel so brave as they had done. Cyril took up a book, but it was not interesting to read. Robert kicked a chair leg absently. His feet were always eloquent in moments of emotion. Anthea stood pleating the ends of the tablecloth into folds. She seemed earnestly anxious to get all the pleats the same size. The sound of Jane's sobs had died away. Suddenly Anthea said, Oh, let it be Pax, poor little pussy. You know she's the youngest. She called us beasts, said Robert, kicking the chair suddenly. Well, said Cyril, who was subject to passing fits of justice. We began, you know. At least you did. Cyril's justice was always uncompromising. I'm not going to say I'm sorry if you mean that, said Robert and the chair-leg cracked to the kick he gave as he said it. "'Oh, do let's,' said Anthea. "'We're three to one, and Mother does so hate it if we row. Come on, I'll say I'm sorry first, though I didn't say anything hardly.' "'All right, let's get it over,' said Cyril, opening the door. "'Hi, you, pussy!' Far away, up the stairs, a voice could be heard singing, brokenly but still defiantly, How many miles to Babylon? Three score and ten. Can I get there by candlelight? Yes, and back again. <laughs> it was trying, for this was plainly meant to annoy, but Anthea would not give herself time to think this. She led the way up the stairs taking three at a time, and bounded to the level of Jane, who was sat on the top step of all, thumping her doll to the tune of the song she was trying to sing. I say, pussy, let it be Pax. We're sorry if you are. It was enough. The kiss of peace was given by all. Jane, being the youngest, was entitled to this ceremonial. Anthea added a special apology of her own. I'm sorry if I was a pig, pussy dear, she said especially because, in my really and truly inside mind, I've been feeling a little as if I'd rather not go into the past again either. But then, do think, if we don't go, we shan't get the amulet. And, oh, pussy, think, if we could only get father and mother and the lamb safe back. We must go, but we'll wait a day or two if you like, and then perhaps you'll feel braver. Raw meat makes you brave, however cowardly you are said Robert, to show that there was now no ill-feeling. And cranberries. That's what tartars eat, and they're so brave it's simply awful. I suppose cranberries are only for Christmas time, but I'll ask old nurse to let you have your chop very raw if you like. I think I could be brave without that, said Jane hastily. She hated underdone meat. I'll try. At this moment the door of the learned gentleman's room opened, and he looked out. "'Excuse me,' he said, in that gentle, polite, weary voice of his. "'But was I mistaken in thinking that I caught a familiar word just now? Were you not singing some old ballad of Babylon?' "'No,' said Robert. "'At least Jane was singing How Many Miles, but I shouldn't have thought you could have heard the words for—' "'He would have said—' "'For the sniffing.' But Anthea pinched him just in time. I did not hear all the words, said the learned gentleman. 
I wonder, would you recite them to me? So they all said together, How many miles to Babylon? Three score and ten. Can I get there by candlelight? Yes, and back again. I wish one could, the learned gentleman said with a sigh. Can't you? asked Jane. Babylon has fallen, he answered with a sigh. You know it was once a great and beautiful city, and the centre of learning and art, and now it is only ruins, and so covered up with earth that people are not even agreed as to where it once stood. He was leaning on the banisters, and his eyes had a far-away look in them, as though he could see through the staircase window the splendour and glory of ancient Babylon. "'I say,' Cyril remarked abruptly, "'do you know that charm we showed you, and you told us how to say the name that's on it?' "'Yes.' "'Well, do you think that charm was ever in Babylon?' "'It's quite possible,' the learned gentleman replied. "'Such charms have been found in very early Egyptian tombs, "'yet their origin has not been accurately determined as Egyptian. "'They may have been brought from Asia. Oh, "'Supposing the charm to have been fashioned in Egypt, "'it might very well have been carried to Babylon by some friendly embassy.' brought back by the Babylonish army from some Egyptian campaign as part of the spoils of war. The inscription may be much later than the charm. Oh, yes, it is a pleasant fancy that that splendid specimen of yours was once used amid Babylonish surroundings. The others looked at each other, but it was Jane who spoke. Were the Babylon people savages? Were they always fighting and throwing things about? for she had read the thoughts of the others by the unerring light of her own fears. The Babylonians were certainly more gentle than the Assyrians, said the learned gentleman, and they were not savages by any means. A very high level of culture. He looked doubtfully at his audience, and went on, I mean that they made beautiful statues and jewellery, and built splendid palaces and they were very learned. They had glorious libraries and high towers for the purpose of astrological and astronomical observation. Er, uh, said Robert, I mean for stargazing and fortune-telling, said the learned gentleman. And there were temples and beautiful hanging gardens. I'll go to Babylon if you like, said Jane abruptly and the others hastened to say, Done! before she should have time to change her mind. Ah, said the learned gentleman, smiling rather sadly. One can go so far in dreams when one is young. He sighed again, and then, adding with a laboured briskness, I hope you'll have a, a jolly game. He went into his room and shut the door. He said jolly, as if it was a foreign language, said Cyril. Come on, let's get the Samiad and go now. I think Babylon seems the most frightfully jolly place to go to. So they woke the Samiad and put it in its bass bag, with the waterproof sheet in case of inclement weather in Babylon. It was very cross, but it said it would as soon go to Babylon as anywhere else. The sand is good thereabouts, it added. Then Jane held up the charm, and Cyril said, We want to go to Babylon to look for the part of you that was lost. Will you please let us go there through you? Please put us down just outside, said Jane hastily. And then if we don't like it, we needn't go inside. Don't be all day, said the Samiad. So Anthea hastily uttered the word of power, without which the charm could do nothing. Er Hekal Seche, she said softly, and as she spoke, the charm grew into an arch so tall that the top of it was close against the bedroom ceiling. Outside the arch was the bedroom painted chest of drawers and the Kidderminster carpet, and the washhand stand with the riveted willow pattern jug, and the faded curtains, and the dull light of indoors on a wet day. Through the arch showed the gleam of soft green leaves and white blossoms. 
they stepped forward quite happily even jane felt that this did not look like lions and her hand hardly trembled at all as she held the charm for the others to go through and last slipped through herself and hung the charm now grown small again round her neck the children found themselves under a white blossomed green leafed fruit tree in what seemed to be an orchard of such trees all white flowered and green foliaged among the long green grass under their feet grew crocuses and lilies and strange blue flowers in the branches overhead thrushes and blackbirds were singing and the coo of a pigeon came softly to them in the green quietness of the orchard oh how perfectly lovely cried anthea why it's like home exactly i mean england only everything's bluer and whiter and greener and the flowers are bigger the boys owned that it certainly was fairly decent and even jane admitted that it was all very pretty i'm certain there's nothing to be frightened of here said anthea i don't know said jane i suppose the fruit trees go on just the same even when people are killing each other i didn't half like what the learned gentleman said about the hanging gardens i suppose they have gardens on purpose to hang people in i do hope this isn't one of course it isn't said cyril the hanging gardens are just gardens hung up i think on chains between houses don't you know like trays come on let's get somewhere they began to walk through the cool grass as far as they could see was nothing but trees and trees and more trees at the end of their orchard was another one only separated from theirs by a little stream of clear water they jumped this and went on cyril who was fond of gardening which meant that he liked to watch the gardener at work was able to command the respect of the others by telling them the names of a good many trees there were nut trees and almond trees and apricots and fig trees with their big five-fingered leaves and every now and then the children had to cross another brook it's like between the squares and through the looking-glass said anthea at last they came to an orchard which was quite different from the other orchards it had a low building in one corner these are vines said cyril superiorly and i know this is a vineyard i shouldn't wonder if there was a wine press inside that place over there at last they got out of the orchards and on to a sort of road very rough and not at all like the roads you are used to it had cypress trees and acacia trees along it and a sort of hedge of tamarisks like those you see on the road between nice and cannes or near littlehampton if you've only been as far as that and now in front of them they could see a great mass of buildings there were scattered houses of wood and stone here and there among green orchards and beyond these a great wall that shone red in the early morning sun the wall was enormously high more than half the height of st paul's and in the wall were set enormous gates that shone like gold as the rising sun beat on them each gate had a solid square tower on each side of it that stood out from the wall and rose above it beyond the wall were more towers and houses gleaming with gold and bright colours away to the left ran the steel-blue swirl of a great river and the children could see through a gap in the trees that the river flowed out from the town under a great arch in the wall those feathery things along by the water are palms said cyril instructively oh yes you know everything robert replied what's all that grey-green stuff you see away over there where it's all flat and sandy all right said cyril loftily i don't want to tell you anything i only thought you'd like to know a palm tree when you saw it again look cried anthea they're opening the gates and indeed the great gates swung back with a brazen clang and instantly a little crowd of a dozen or more people came out and along the road towards them the children with one accord crouched behind the tamarisk hedge i don't like the sound of those gates said jane fancy being inside when they're shut you'd never get out you've got an arch of your own to go out by the samiad put its head out of the basket to remind her don't behave so like a girl 
if i were you i should just march right into the town and ask to see the king there was something at once simple and grand about this idea and it pleased everyone so when the work people had passed they were work people the children felt sure because they were dressed so plainly just one long blue shirt thing of blue or yellow the four children marched boldly up to the brazen gate between the towers the arch above the gate was quite a tunnel the walls were so thick courage said cyril step out it's no use trying to sneak past be bold robert answered this appeal by unexpectedly bursting into the british grenadiers and to its quick step they approached the gates of babylon some talk of alexander and some of hercules of hector and lysander and such great names as these but of all the gallant heroes this brought them to the threshold of the gate and two men in bright armour suddenly barred their way with crossed spears who goes there they said i think i must have explained to you before how it was that the children were always able to understand the language of any place they might happen to be in and to be themselves understood if not i have no time to explain it now we come from very far said cyril mechanically from the empire where the sun never sets and we want to see your king if it's quite convenient amended anthea the king may he live forever said the gatekeeper he's gone to fetch home his fourteenth wife where on earth have you come from not to know that the queen then said anthea hurriedly and not taking any notice of the question as to where they had come from the queen said the gatekeeper may she live forever gives audience today three hours after sun rising but what are we going to do till the end of the three hours asked cyril the gatekeeper seemed neither to know nor to care he appeared less interested in them than they could have thought possible but the man who had crossed spears with him to bar the children's way was more human let them go in and look about them he said i'll wager my best sword they've never seen anything to come near our little village he said it in the tone people use for when they call the atlantic ocean the herring pond the gatekeeper hesitated they're only children after all said the other who had children of his own let me off for a few minutes captain and i'll take them to my place and see if my good woman can't fit them up in something a little less outlandish than their present rig <laughs> then they can have a look round without being mobbed may i go oh yes if you like said the captain but don't be all day the man led them through the dark arch into the town and it was very different from london for one thing everything in london seems to be patched up out of odds and ends but these houses seemed to have been built by people who liked the same sort of things not that they were all alike for though all were squarish they were of different sizes and decorated in all sorts of different ways some with paintings in bright colours some with black and silver designs there were terraces and gardens and balconies and open spaces with trees their guide took them to a little house in a back street where a kind-faced woman sat spinning at the door of a very dark room here he said just lend these children a mantle each so that they can go about and see the place till the queen's audience begins you leave that wool for a bit and show them round if you like i must be off now the woman did as she was told and the four children wrapped in fringed mantles went with her all about the town and oh how i wish i had time to tell you all that they saw it was all so wonderfully different from anything you have ever seen for one thing all the houses were dazzlingly bright and many of them covered with pictures some had great creatures carved in stone at each side of the door then the people there were no black frock coats and tall hats no dingy coats and skirts of good useful ugly stuffs warranted to wear everyone's clothes were bright and beautiful 
with blue and scarlet and green and gold the market was brighter than you would think anything could be there were stalls for everything you could possibly want and for a great many things that if you wanted here and now want would be your master there were pineapples and peaches in heaps and stalls of crockery and glass things beautiful shapes and glorious colours there were stalls for necklaces and clasps and bracelets and brooches for woven stuffs and furs and embroidered linen the children had never seen half so many beautiful things together even at liberty's it seemed no time at all before the woman said it's nearly time now we ought to be getting on towards the palace it's as well to be early so they went to the palace and when they got there it was more splendid than anything they had seen yet for it was glowing with colours and with gold and silver and black and white like some magnificent embroidery flight after flight of broad marble steps led up to it and at the edges of the stairs stood great images twenty times as big as a man images of men with wings like chain armour and hawks heads and winged men with the heads of dogs and there were the statues of great kings between the flights of steps were terraces where fountains played and the queen's guard in white and scarlet and armour that shone like gold stood by twos lining the way up the stairs and a great body of them was massed by the vast door of the palace itself where it stood glittering like an impossibly radiant peacock in the noonday sun all sorts of people were passing up the steps to seek audience of the queen ladies in richly embroidered dresses with fringy flounces poor folks in plain and simple clothes dandies with beards oiled and curled and cyril robert anthea and jane went with the crowd at the gate of the palace the samiad put one eye cautiously out of the basket and whispered i can't be bothered with queens i'll go home with this lady i'm sure she'll get me some sand if you ask her to oh don't leave us said jane the woman was giving some last instructions in court etiquette to anthea and did not hear jane don't be a little moth said the samiad quite fiercely it's not a bit of good your having a charm you never use it if you want me you've only got to say the name of power and ask the charm to bring me to you i'd rather go with you said jane and it was the most surprising thing she had ever said in her life every one opened its mouth without thinking of manners and anthea who was peeping into the samiad's basket saw that its mouth opened wider than anybody's you needn't gawp like that jane went on i'm not going to be bothered with queens any more than it is and i know wherever it is it'll take jolly good care that it's safe she's, she's right there, there said everyone for they had observed that the samiad had a way of knowing which side its bread was buttered she turned to the woman and said you'll take me home with you won't you and let me play with your little girls till the others have done with the queen surely i will little heart said the woman and then anthea hurriedly stroked the samiad and embraced jane who took the woman's hand and trotted contentedly away with the samiad's bag under the other arm the others stood looking after her till she the woman and the basket were lost in the many-coloured crowd then anthea turned once more to the palace's magnificent doorway and said let's ask the porter to take care of our babylonian overcoats so they took off the garments that the woman had lent them and stood amid the jostling petitioners of the queen in their own english frocks and coats and hats and boots we want to see the queen said cyril we come from the far empire where the sun never sets a murmur of surprise and a thrill of excitement ran through the crowd the door porter spoke to a black man he spoke to someone else there was a whispering waiting pause then a big man with a cleanly shaven face beckoned them from the top of a flight of red marble steps they went up the boots of robert clattering more than usual because he was so nervous a door swung open a curtain was drawn back a double line of bowing forms in gorgeous raiment formed a lane that led to the steps of the throne 
and as the children advanced hurriedly there came from the throne a voice very sweet and kind three children from the land where the sun never sets let them draw hither without fear in another minute they were kneeling at the throne's foot saying o oh, queen live, live forever. forever exactly as the woman had taught them and a splendid dream lady all gold and silver and jewels and snowy drift of veils was raising anthea and saying don't be frightened i really am so glad you came the land where the sun never sets i am delighted to see you i was getting quite too dreadfully bored for anything and behind anthea the kneeling cyril whispered in the ears of the respectful robert bobs don't say anything to panther it's no use upsetting her but we didn't ask for jane's address and the samiad's with her well whispered robert the charm can bring them to us at any moment it said so oh yes whispered cyril in miserable derision we're all right of course so we are oh yes if we'd only got the charm then robert saw and he murmured crikey at the foot of the throne of babylon while cyril hoarsely whispered the plain english fact jane's got the charm around her neck you silly cuckoo crikey robert repeated in heartbroken undertones end of chapter six chapter seven of the story of the amulet this librivox recording is in the public domain the story of the amulet by edith nesbit chapter seven the deepest dungeon below the castle moat the queen threw three of the red and gold embroidered cushions off the throne on to the marble steps that led up to it just make yourselves comfortable there she said i'm simply dying to talk to you and to hear all about your wonderful country and how you got here and everything but i have to do justice every morning such a bore isn't it do you do justice in your own country no said cyril uh, at least of course we try to but not in this public sort of way only in private oh yes said the queen i should much prefer a private audience myself much easier to manage but public opinion has to be considered doing justice is very hard work even when you're brought up to it we don't do justice but we have to do scales jane and me said anthea twenty minutes a day it's simply horrid what are scales asked the queen and what is jane jane is my little sister one of the guards at the gate's wife is taking care of her and scales are music i never heard of the instrument said the queen do you sing oh yes we can sing in parts said anthea that is magic said the queen how many parts are you each cut into before you do it we aren't cut at all said robert hastily we couldn't sing if we were we'll show you afterwards so you shall and now sit quiet like dear children and hear me do justice the way i do it has always been admired i oughtn't to say that ought i sounds so conceited but i don't mind with you dears somehow i feel as though i'd known you quite a long time already the queen settled herself on her throne and made a signal to her attendants the children whispering together among the cushions on the steps of the throne decided that she was very beautiful and very kind but perhaps just the least bit flighty the first person who came to ask for justice was a woman whose brother had taken the money the father had left for her the brother said it was the uncle who had the money there was a good deal of talk and the children were growing rather bored when the queen suddenly clapped her hands and said put both the men in prison till one of them owns up that the other is innocent but suppose they both did it cyril could not help interrupting then prison's the best place for them said the queen 
but suppose neither did it <laughs> that's impossible said the queen a thing's not done unless someone does it and you mustn't interrupt then came a woman in tears with a torn veil and real ashes on her head at least anthea thought so but it may have been only road dust she complained that her husband was in prison what for said the queen they said it was for speaking evil of your majesty said the woman but it wasn't someone had a spite against him that was what it was how do you know he hadn't spoken evil of me said the queen no one could said the woman simply when they'd once seen your beautiful face let the man out said the queen smiling next case the next case was that of a boy who had stolen a fox like the spartan boy whispered robert but the queen ruled that nobody could have any possible reason for owning a fox and still less for stealing one and she did not believe that there were any foxes in babylon she at any rate had never seen one so the boy was released the people came to the queen about all sorts of family quarrels and neighbourly misunderstandings from a fight between brothers over the division of an inheritance to the dishonest and unfriendly conduct of a woman who had borrowed a cooking pot at the last new year's festival and not returned it yet and the queen decided everything very very decidedly indeed at last she clapped her hands quite suddenly and with extreme loudness and said the audience is over for today everyone said may the queen live forever and went out and the children were left alone in the justice hall with the queen of babylon and her ladies there said the queen with a long sigh of relief that's over i couldn't have done another stitch of justice if you'd offered me the crown of egypt now come into the garden and we'll have a nice long cosy talk she led them through long narrow corridors whose walls they somehow felt were very very thick into a sort of garden courtyard there were thick shrubs closely planted and roses were trained over trellises and made a pleasant shade needed indeed for already the sun was as hot as it is in england in august at the seaside slaves spread cushions on a low marble terrace and a big man with a smooth face served cool drink in cups of gold studded with beryls he drank a little from the queen's cup before handing it to her that's rather a nasty trick whispered robert who had been carefully taught never to drink out of one of the nice shiny metal cups that are chained to the london drinking fountains without first rinsing it out thoroughly the queen overheard him oh, not at all said she ritti marduk is a very clean man and one has to have some one as taster you know because of poison the word made the children feel rather creepy but ritti marduk had tasted all the cups so they felt pretty safe the drink was delicious very cold and tasting like lemonade and partly like penny ices leave us said the queen and all the court ladies in their beautiful many-folded many-coloured fringed dresses filed out slowly and the children were left alone with the queen now she said tell me all about yourselves they looked at each other you bobs said cyril no anthea said robert no you cyril said anthea don't you remember how pleased the queen of india was when you told her all about us cyril muttered that it was all very well and so it was for when he had told the tale of the phoenix and the carpet to the rani it had been only the truth and all the truth that he had to tell but now it was not easy to tell a convincing story without mentioning the amulet which of course it wouldn't have done to mention and without owning that they were really living in london about two thousand five hundred years later than the time they were talking in cyril took refuge in the tale of the samiad and its wonderful power of making wishes come true 
the children had never been able to tell anyone before and cyril was surprised to find that the spell which kept them silent in london did not work here something to do with our being in the past i suppose he said to himself this is most interesting said the queen we must have this samiet for the banquet to-night its performance will be one of the most popular turns in the whole programme where is it antia explained that they did not know also why it was that they did not know oh that's quite simple said the queen and everyone breathed a deep sigh of relief as she said it Riti marduk shall run down to the gates and find out which guard your sister went home with might he antia's voice was tremulous might he would it interfere with his meal-times or anything like that if he went now of course he shall go now he may think himself lucky if he gets his meals at any time said the queen heartily and clapped her hands may i send a letter asked cyril pulling out a red-backed penny account book and feeling in his pockets for a stump of pencil that he knew was in one of them by all means i'll call my scribe oh i can scribe right enough thanks said cyril finding the pencil and licking its point he even had to bite the wood a little for it was very blunt oh you clever clever boy said the queen do let me watch you do it cyril wrote on a leaf of the book it was of rough woolly paper with hairs that stuck out and would have got in his pen if he had been using one and ruled for accounts hide it most carefully before you come here he wrote and don't mention it and destroy this letter everything is going a one the queen is a fair treat there's nothing to be afraid of what curious characters and what a strange flat surface said the queen what have you inscribed i've scribed replied cyril cautiously that you are fair and uh and like uh like a festival and that she need not be afraid and that she is to come at once Ritty marduk who had come in and had stood waiting while cyril wrote his babylonish eyes nearly starting out of his babylonish head now took the letter with some reluctance o oh, queen live forever is it a charm he timidly asked a strong charm most great lady yes said robert unexpectedly it is a charm but it won't hurt anyone until you've given it to jane and then she'll destroy it so that it can't hurt anyone it's most awful strong as strong as peppermint he ended abruptly i know not the god said ritty marduk bending timorously she'll tear it up directly she gets it said robert that'll end the charm you needn't be afraid if you go now ritty marduk went seemingly only partly satisfied and then the queen began to admire the penny account book and the bit of pencil in so marked and significant a way that cyril felt he could not do less than press them upon her as a gift she ruffled the leaves delightedly what a wonderful substance she said and with this style you make charms make a charm for me do you know her voice sank to a whisper the names of the great ones of your own far country rather said cyril and hastily wrote the names of alfred the great shakespeare nelson gordon lord beaconsfield mr rudyard kipling and mr sherlock holmes while the queen watched him with unbated breath as anthea said afterwards she took the book and hid it reverently among the bright folds of her gown you shall teach me later to say the great names she said and the names of their ministers perhaps the great nisroch is one of them i don't think so said cyril mr campbell bannerman's prime minister and mr burns a minister and so is the archbishop of canterbury i think but i'm not sure 
and dr parker was one i know and no more said the queen putting her hands to her ears my head's going round with all those great names you shall teach them to me later because of course you'll make us a nice long visit now you have come won't you now tell me but no i am quite tired out with your being so clever besides i'm sure you'd like me to tell you something wouldn't you yes said anthea i want to know how it is that the king has gone excuse me but you should say the king may he live for ever said the queen gently i beg your pardon anthea hastened to say the king may he live for ever has gone to fetch home his fourteenth wife i don't think even bluebeard had as many as that and besides he hasn't killed you at any rate the queen looked bewildered she means explained robert that english kings only have one wife at least henry the eighth had seven or eight but not all at once in our country said the queen scornfully a king would not reign a day who had only one wife no one would respect him and quite right too then are all the other thirteen alive asked anthea of course they are poor mean-spirited things i don't associate with them of course i am the queen they're only the wives i see said anthea gasping but oh my dears the queen went on such a to-do as there's been about this last wife you never did it really was too funny we wanted an egyptian princess the king may he live for ever has got a wife from most of the important nations and he had set his heart on an egyptian one to complete his collection well of course to begin with we send a handsome present of gold the egyptian king sent back some horses quite a few he's fearfully stingy and he said he liked the gold very much but what they were really short of was lapis lazuli so of course we sent him some but by that time he'd begun to use the gold to cover the beams of the roof of the temple of the sun god and he hadn't nearly enough to finish the job so we sent some more and so it went on oh for years you see each journey takes at least six months and at last we asked the hand of his daughter in marriage yes and then said anthea who wanted to get to the princess part of the story well then said the queen when he'd got everything out of us that he could and only given the meanest presents in return he sent to say he would esteem the honour of an alliance very highly only unfortunately he hadn't any daughter but he hoped one would be born soon and if so she should certainly be reserved for the king of babylon what a trick said cyril yes wasn't it so then we said his sister would do and then there were more gifts and more journeys and now at last the tiresome black-haired thing is coming and the king may he live for ever has gone seven days journey to meet her at Carchemish, and he's gone in his best chariot the one inlaid with lapis lazuli and gold with the gold-plated wheels and onyx-studded hubs much too great an honour in my opinion she'll be here to-night there'll be a great banquet to celebrate her arrival she won't be present of course she'll be having her bath and her anointings and all that sort of thing we always clean our foreign brides very carefully it takes two or three weeks now it's dinner time and you shall eat with me for i can see that you are of high rank she led them into a dark cool hall with many cushions on the floor on these they sat and low tables were brought beautiful tables of smooth blue stone mounted in gold on these golden trays were placed 
but there were no knives or forks or spoons the children expected the queen to call for them but no she just ate with her fingers and as the first dish was a great tray of boiled corn and meat and raisins all mixed up together and melted fat poured all over the tray it was found difficult to follow her example with anything like what we are used to think of as good table manners there were stewed quinces afterwards and dates in syrup and thick yellow cream it was the kind of dinner you hardly ever get in fitzroy street after dinner everybody went to sleep even the children the queen awoke with a start good gracious she cried what a time we've slept i must rush off and dress for the banquet i shan't have much more than time hasn't Ritty marduk got back with our sister and the samiad yet anthea asked i quite forgot to ask i'm sorry said the queen and of course they wouldn't announce her unless i told them to except during justice hours i expect she's waiting outside i'll see Ritty marduk came in a moment later i regret he said that i have been unable to find your sister the beast she bears with her in a basket has bitten the child of the guard and your sister and the beast set out to come to you the police say they have a clue no doubt we shall have news of her in a few weeks he bowed and withdrew the horror of this threefold loss jane the samiad and the amulet gave the children something to talk about while the queen was dressing i shall not report their conversation it was very gloomy every one repeated himself several times and the discussion ended in each of them blaming the other two for having let jane go you know the sort of talk it was don't you at last cyril said after all she's with the samiad so she's all right the samiad is jolly careful of itself too and it isn't as if we were in any danger let's try to buck up and enjoy the banquet they did enjoy the banquet they had a beautiful bath which was delicious were heavily oiled all over including their hair and that was most unpleasant then they dressed again and were presented to the king who was most affable the banquet was long there were all sorts of nice things to eat and everybody seemed to eat and drink a good deal every one lay on cushions and couches ladies on one side and gentlemen on the other and after the eating was done each lady went and sat by some gentleman who seemed to be her sweetheart or her husband for they were very affectionate to each other the court dresses had gold threads woven in them very bright and beautiful the middle of the room was left clear and different people came and did amusing things there were conjurers and jugglers and snake charmers which last anthea did not like at all when it got dark torches were lighted cedar splinters dipped in oil blazed in copper dishes set high on poles then there was a dancer who hardly danced at all only just struck attitudes she had hardly any clothes and was not at all pretty the children were rather bored by her but every one else was delighted including the king by the bird of nimrod he cried ask what you like girl and you shall have it i want nothing said the dancer the honour of having pleased the king may he live for ever is reward enough for me and the king was so pleased with this modest and sensible reply that he gave her the gold collar off his own neck i say said cyril awed by the magnificence of the gift it's all right whispered the queen it's not his best collar by any means we always keep a stock of cheap jewellery for these occasions and now you promise to sing us something would you like my minstrels to accompany you no thank you said anthea quickly the minstrels had been playing off and on all the time and their music reminded anthea of the band she and the others had once had on the fifth of november with penny horns a tin whistle a tea-tray the tongs a policeman's rattle and a toy drum they had enjoyed this band very much at the time 
but it was quite different when someone else was making the same kind of music. Anthea understood now that father had not been really heartless and unreasonable when he had told them to stop that infuriating din. "'What shall we sing?' Cyril was asking. "'Sweet and low?' suggested Anthea. "'Too soft. I vote for who will o'er the downs. Now then. One, two, three. Oh, who will o'er the downs so free? Oh, who will with me ride? Oh, who will up and follow me to win a blooming bride? Her father, he has locked the door. Her mother keeps the key. But neither bolt nor bar shall keep my own true love from me. Jane, the alto, was missing, and Robert, unlike the mother of the lady in the song, never could keep the key. But the song, even so, was sufficiently unlike anything any of them had ever heard to rouse the Babylonian court to the wildest enthusiasm. More, more! cried the king oh by my beard this savage music is a new thing sing again so they sang i saw her bower at twilight great was guarded safe and sure i saw her bower at break of day twas guarded then no more the violets they were all asleep and there was none to see the greeting fair had passed and there between my love and me shouts of applause greeted the ending of the verse and the king would not be satisfied till they had sung all their part songs they only knew three twice over and ended up with men of Harlech in unison. Then the king stood up in his royal robes with his high narrow crown on his head and shouted, By the beak of Nisroch, ask what you will. Strangers from the land where the sun never sets. We ought to say it's enough honour, like the dancer did, whispered Anthea. No, let's ask for it, said Robert. No, no, I'm sure the other's manners, said Anthea. But Robert, who was excited by the music and the flaring torches and the applause and the opportunity, spoke up before the others could stop him. Give us the half of the amulet that has on it the name Ur Hekau Secha, he said, adding as an afterthought, O king, live forever. As he spoke the great name, those in the pillared hall fell on their faces and lay still. All but the queen who crouched amid her cushions with her head in her hands, and the king, who stood upright, perfectly still, like the statue of a king in stone. It was only for a moment, though. Then his great voice thundered out, God seize them! Instantly, from nowhere, as it seemed, sprang eight soldiers in bright armour inlaid with gold, and tunics of red and white. Very splendid they were, and very alarming. Impious and sacrilegious wretches! shouted the king to the dungeons with them we'll find a way tomorrow to make them speak for without doubt they can tell us where to find the last half of it a wall of scarlet and white and steel and gold closed up round the children and hurried them away among the many pillars of the great hall as they went they heard the voices of the courtiers loud in horror you've done it this time said cyril with extreme bitterness oh it will come right it must it always does said anthea desperately they could not see where they were going because the guard surrounded them so closely but the ground under their feet smooth marble at first grew rougher like stone then it was loose earth and sand and they felt the night air then there was more stone and stepped down it's my belief we really are going to the deepest dungeon below the castle moat this time said cyril and they were at least it was not below a moat but below the river euphrates which was just as bad if not worse in a most unpleasant place it was dark very very damp and with an odd musty smell rather like the shells of oysters 
there was a torch that is to say a copper basket on a high stick with oiled wood burning in it by its light the children saw that the walls were green and that trickles of water ran down them and dripped from the roof there were things on the floor that looked like newts and in the dark corners creepy shiny things moved sluggishly uneasily horribly robert's heart sank right into those really reliable boots of his anthea and cyril each had a private struggle with that inside disagreeableness which is part of all of us and which is sometimes called the old adam and both were victors neither of them said to robert and both tried hard not even to think it this is your doing anthea had the additional temptation to add i told you so and she resisted it successfully sacrilege and impious cheek said the captain of the guard to the jailer to be kept during the king's pleasure i expect he means to get some pleasure out of them tomorrow he'll tickle them up poor little kids said the jailer oh yes said the captain i've got kids of my own too but it doesn't do to let domestic sentiment interfere with one's public duties good night the soldiers tramped heavily off in their white and red and steel and gold the jailer with a bunch of big keys in his hand stood looking pityingly at the children he shook his head twice and went out courage said anthea i know it will be all right it's only a dream really you know it must be i don't believe about time being only a something or other of thought it is a dream and we're bound to wake up all right and safe hum said cyril bitterly and robert suddenly said it's all my doing if it really is all up do please not keep a down on me about it and tell father oh i forgot what he had forgotten was that his father was three thousand miles and five thousand or more years away from him all right bobs old man said cyril and anthea got hold of robert's hand and squeezed it then the jailer came back with a platter of hard flat cakes made of coarse grain very different from the cream and juicy date feasts of the palace also a pitcher of water there he said oh thank you so very much you are kind said anthea feverishly go to sleep said the jailer pointing to a heap of straw in a corner to-morrow comes soon enough oh dear mr jailer said anthea whatever will they do to us to-morrow they'll try to make you tell things said the jailer grimly and my advice is if you've nothing to tell make up something then perhaps they'll sell you to the northern nations regular savages they are good night good night said three trembling voices which their owners strove in vain to render firm then he went out and the three were left alone in the damp dim vault i know the light won't last long said cyril looking up at the flickering brazier is it any good do you think calling on the name when we haven't got the charm suggested anthea i shouldn't think so but we might try so they tried but the blank silence of the damp dungeon remained unchanged what was the name the queen said asked cyril suddenly nisbeth nesbit something you know the slave of the great names wait a sec said robert though i don't know why you want it nuzrock nisrock nisrock that's it then anthea pulled herself together all her muscles tightened and the muscles of her mind and soul if you can call them that tightened too er hekau seche she cried in a fervent voice oh nisrock servant of the great ones come and help us there was a waiting silence then a cold blue light awoke in the corner where the straw was and in the light they saw coming towards them a strange and terrible figure i won't try to describe it because the drawing shows it exactly as it was and exactly as the old babylonians carved it on their stones so that you can see it in our own british museum at this day 
i will just say that it had eagle's wings and an eagle's head and the body of a man it came towards them strong and unspeakably horrible oh go away cried anthea but cyril cried no stay the creature hesitated then bowed low before them on the damp floor of the dungeon speak it said in a harsh grating voice like large rusty keys being turned in locks the servant of the great ones is your servant what is your need that you call on the name of nisro we want to go home said robert no no cried anthea we want to be where jane is nisroch raised his great arm and pointed at the wall of the dungeon and as he pointed the wall disappeared and instead of the damp green rocky surface there shone and glowed a room with rich hangings of red silk embroidered with golden water lilies with cushioned couches and great mirrors of polished steel and in it was the queen and before her on a red pillow sat the samiad its fur hunched up in an irritated discontented way on a blue covered couch lay jane fast asleep walk forward without fear said nisroch is there aught else that the servant of the great name can do for those who speak that name no oh no said cyril it's all right now thanks ever so you are a dear cried anthea not in the least knowing what she was saying oh thank you thank you but do go now she caught the hand of the creature and it was cold and hard in hers like a hand of stone go forward said nisroch and they went oh my good gracious said the queen as they stood before her how did you get here i knew you were magic i meant to let you out the first thing in the morning if i could slip away but thanks be to dagon you've managed it for yourselves you must get away i'll wake my chief lady and she shall call Ritti marduk and he'll let you out the back way and don't rouse anybody for goodness sake said anthea except jane and i'll rouse her she shook jane with energy and jane slowly awoke <sighs> Ritti marduk brought them in hours ago really said the queen but i wanted to have the sammy at all to myself for a bit you'll excuse the little natural deception it's part of the babylonish character don't you know but i don't want anything to happen to you do let me rouse some one no 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 said anthea with desperate earnestness she thought she knew enough of what the babylonians were like when they were roused we can go by our own magic and you will tell the king it wasn't the jailer's fault it was nisroch nisroch echoed the queen you are indeed magicians jane sat up blinking stupidly hold it up and say the word cried cyril catching up the samiad which mechanically bit him but only very slightly which is the east asked jane behind me said the queen why er hekosetcha said jane sleepily and held up the charm and there they all were in the dining-room at three hundred fitzroy street jane cried cyril with great presence of mind go and get the plate of sand down for the samia jane went look here he said quickly as the sound of her boots grew less loud on the stairs don't let's tell her about the dungeon and all that it'll only frighten her so that she'll never want to go anywhere else right -o said robert but anthea felt that she could not have said a word to save her life why did you want to come back in such a hurry asked jane returning with the plate of sand it was awfully jolly in babylon i think i liked it no end oh yes said cyril carelessly it was jolly enough of course but i thought we'd been there long enough mother always says you oughtn't to wear out your welcome the end of chapter 7